Majestic Towers soar 552 feet above the water and extend another 210 feet below the surface to rest on bedrock. With 8,344 feet from cable anchorage to cable anchorage, the Mighty Mac is the Western Hemisphere's longest suspension bridge. Over 42,000 miles of wire are banded together to form the massive 24 and one half inch diameter main cables. The roadbed is 199 feet above the water surface of midspan. The water in midspan is 295 feet deep. Prior to the bridge opening, the Michigan Department of Transportation operated car ferries between Mackinac City and St. Ignace. In their last year of operation, these ferries accounted for some 900,000 vehicles crossing the straits. Currently, the bridge carries over 4.8 million vehicles each year. The Mackinac Bridge serves as the gateway to the unspoiled natural beauty of the Upper Peninsula. The Upper Peninsula of Michigan, miles away from the metropolitan civilization, and not a Walmart or a Costco in sight. Beautiful for four months out of the year and bitterly cold with over 120 inches annually of the fluffy white stuff we don't dare speak about in the lower states. My journey starts in St. Ignace. St. Ignace is just a small city built upon the shores of Lake Huron and the Mackinac Straits. Founded in the early 1700s by French missionaries, it makes this city the second oldest European founded city in the state of Michigan. St. Ignace did not see its boom in population until the construction of the rail lines, which brought the tourists in the early 20th century to explore Mackinac Island, St. Ignace's neighbor. Tourism is still the largest sector as motel after motel lines the main street with old storefronts now housing souvenir shops, confectionaries, and small restaurants. Speaking of restaurants, Paul and I head out to one of the main flagship eateries in St. Ignace, the Mackinac Grill, where we are sampling a couple of whitefish dishes. Whitefish is the local specialty for the Upper Peninsula and it's delicious, whether fried, smoked, or baked. I highly recommend it. After dinner, we're close enough for an evening stroll on the boardwalk in the docking area, just in time to admire the gorgeous sunsets commonly seen in Michigan. If there's anything I can highly recommend for someone going to Mackinac Island during the high season, it's go early. For going any type of breakfast, we grabbed some snacks and headed down towards the ferry ports. It was a nice 60 degrees in the morning, which made for a 50-ish degree ride on top of the deck of the ferry. The lake water is calm and smooth with no signs of boats. We set out on our 15-minute trek to Mackinac Island. The sun starting his ascent into the sky and the water sparkling like gems scattered on the surface. And before we knew it, we pulled into port.
After departing the ferry, the scene was that of a sleepy town that just barely awoken and was still yawning. Horse-drawn carriages with supplies brought over made their way from store to store, dropping off supplies. In front of one store, as you can see here on the right, they had already delivered boxes of confectionaries and bags of sugar, supplying them for the onslaught of tourists that would soon come to the island. Paul and I, armed with our trikes, headed out, navigating through the deliveries and carriages of Main Street and onward to the Mackinac Island Loop, which covers eight miles the perimeter of the island. Seven steps, and I did not die. Not yet. The day is still young. This Instagram destination, created for you by Mother Nature, was formed over thousands of years ago by wind and water eroding the soft rock, leaving only the hard breccia rock which forms the arch. Believe me, well worth the 200 step journey. But even if you don't fancy random rock formations, the aerial view up here is absolutely stunning. We start back around on our journey around the 8 mile perimeter, but not without a quick foot soak in the clear waters of Lake Huron. Toes refreshed, we set back out around the island. Our next destination was to the official halfway point of British Landing.
And to our strange but definitely not planned occurrence, we were on Mackinac Island on the exact day in history when the British invaded Fort Mackinac and took over the island with a single fired shot. After a quick rest and history break, we set back off ready to complete the second half of the perimeter. Waves crashed heavily against the shoreline and rocks, likely from the large wakes of the multiple ferries coming to and from St. Ignace and Mackinac City. The groups and the pedestrians were growing thicker around each turn, which led me to believe that we were finally getting closer to civilization. We made it back to civilization, but it was a tad overwhelming. As we rested and grabbed some lunch from the Seabiscuit Cafe in the heart of Main Street, we watched hundreds of people go by, a reminder that this was still high season for the island. Forgoing the Grand Hotel in Fort Mackinac on this particular trip, we headed back across the Straits, fudge and souvenirs in hand. As we filmed this, it was a Sunday, and it was officially my 33rd birthday. What does one do in the Upper Peninsula on a Sunday? Well, head north to more isolation, of course. After a dismal breakfast at the hotel, we stuffed some snacks into our rucksack and headed north to Whitefish Point, the destination of the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum. The drive is calm, and there's not much to occupy one's views other than tall pines that line each side of the road and dots of summertime cabins that have succumbed to neglect over decades of vacancy. You know you're getting close when you start to see the glimpses of Lake Superior between the trees and lakeside cabins and you realize you have now seen three great lakes in a span of a couple days. A few more miles up the road and we dead end into our destination, Whitefish Point, one of the oldest lighthouse points in operation on Lake Superior. Not only do you learn about shipwrecks of the Great Lakes, but you can still view a living quarters of a lighthouse operator before everything was easily automated digitally. If you want to know more about the next exhibition scene, and why I'm so giddy to press a button on a lighthouse, then you'll have to read my blog where I give you the full backstory. Continuing on in the museum, you're taken through the house, which is divided into two sections, a section for the main lighthouse operator and family, and a separate side for the assistant operator and their family, each family working in shifts to ensure that the lights and foghorn did their duty to keep ships from running ashore.
Across the point, you can make out an area of land. As I walk up on the small decking to look out on the beach and Lake Superior, my cell phone notifies me that I am now on a Canadian cell tower. That is how close we are to our neighbors to the north across the way. And with that, my journey has ended. Great food and excellent travels. Are the months of harsh, bitter weather in the winter worth it to the beautiful and gorgeous temps in the summertime? I don't know. That's really up to you to decide. But I found Mackinac breathtaking, beautiful, and just what I was looking for. Well over 200 Thanks, years Michigan. ago, the earliest European explorers struggled against the treacherous currents and unpredictable winds which ruled the Straits of Mackinac, separating what was to become Michigan's upper and lower peninsulas. Early on, the Straits was recognized for their economic and strategic military value. In the 1700s, both the French and the English built forts overlooking the waterway and stationed armies to protect their interests. Travel and commerce between the two peninsulas was limited to whatever could be transported by boat or carried across the ice in the winter. When the upper and lower peninsulas became the state of Michigan in 1837, the problem was compounded. So near, yet so far were the opposing shores. For years, many dreamed of a bridge across the strait, but the technology to build such a structure had not been discovered. It was first proposed in 1884, and from that time until November 1st, 1957, Mighty Mac was known as the bridge that couldn't be built. Actual construction started in 1954 after financing was arranged through the sale of bonds to private investors. A total of $99,800,000 was necessary to complete the project. There were many obstacles to overcome and problems to solve in the design and construction of what was to become one of the safest and most beautiful spans ever built. The total length of the Mackinac Bridge is just 28 feet short of 5 miles. The two majestic towers soar 552 feet above the water and extend another 210 feet below the surface to rest on bedrock. With 8,344 feet from cable anchorage to cable anchorage, the Mighty Mac is the Western Hemisphere's longest suspension bridge. Over 42,000 miles of wire are banded together to form the massive 24 and one half inch diameter main cable. The roadbed is 199 feet above the water surface at midspan. The water at midspan is 295 feet deep. Prior to the bridge opening, the Michigan Department of Transportation operated car ferries between Mackinac City and St. Ignace. In their last year of operation, these ferries accounted for some 900,000 vehicles crossing the strait. Currently, the bridge carries over 4.8 million vehicles each year. The Mackinac Bridge serves as the gateway to the unspoiled natural beauty of the Upper Peninsula.